kick Thank things you. off, I would like um, to invite our host, Virginia Briggs, the CEO of Minta Ellison, to formally welcome us. Thanks so much, Julie. And um, we are just so delighted to be hosting this function today. I was actually in a Champions for Change meeting this morning um, where we referenced the event, and I know that we're incredibly excited on that side of the fence as well um, to be supporting, and also Mint is very excited to be hosting today. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and also to recognise the privilege of living, learning and working on Gadigal land each and every day. We have such a fabulous panel discussion planned today um, on a topic that I'm personally very deeply committed to and that we're very deeply committed to here at Minter Ellison as well. I've really seen the impact of investing in women and girls firsthand. I think I first saw it through the work I did in helping establish the Diversity Committee at the Property Council of Australia. Um, I'm very remotely connected with, but always carefully observing the fantastic uh, work done by the Minerva Network. And um, we also do a lot of professional services mentoring and our own charitable giving and pro bono, pro bono initiatives here at Minter Ellison. Um, and uh, we do a lot of work broadly in this area. And I'm delighted to say that just this week, we heard that our social impact partner, Keith Rovers, and his team, of whom Kate Cato is sitting here in the front row, not going to get by without a special mention, Kate, um, they have been shortlisted for the Social Impact Hub's Market Builder Award at this year's Australian Impact Awards. So we've got our fingers and toes crossed for Kate and Keith and our whole team um, in that respect. But enough from me. I'd like to hand to our MC today, Julie Riley, who we just had a quick chat outside, who said that she'd never really been introduced in a forum like this. So there's the first time for everything, um, Julie. So um, Julie is currently CEO of Australians Investing in Women and brings to the role decades of experience working across government, corporate and not-for-profit not sectors. Um, Julie's extraordinary work, particularly to improve the lives of women and girls and across the charitable sector, has been recognised with numerous awards, including a Churchill Fellowship to study global strategies for growing philanthropy for women and girls, and also a Medal of the Order of Australia in 2021. So um, I'd like you to join me in welcoming... Julie, back to the lecture. Thank you. Virginia, that's very kind. I often don't recognise myself. I shouldn't say I've never been introduced, but when it's our event, I'm not normally. So that's really beautiful of you. Thank you. We're really delighted to be here today. As I said, it's our first formal um, partnership event with the Champions of Change. And you'll hear later from the wonderful, their wonderful CEO, Annika Fryer, who I'm sure is known to many of you. Uh, but at the outset, I'd also like to give a couple of shout-outs. Uh, one to Lisa Whiffen, who is actually in Melbourne and can't be with us today, and one to Lisa Jarvis. So both really fabulous, generous allies that helped us in developing the Corporate Gender Lens Giving Resource that is the subject of today, and we've got copies around um, for those of you who would like a hard copy. Uh, we've got next up the presentation of findings from our very first survey on the, gen the state of gender-wise giving in Australia. And that's going to come to you from Gareth Chandler, who's the founder and CEO of the Evolved Group. We have a conversation with um, two very experienced um, corporate leaders in Sam Mostyn and Ian Silk and moderated, obviously, beautifully by Catherine Fox with Q&A to follow. And we really want to make this an interactive day, so please think very seriously about questions that would um, help you to unpack today. And, of course, that's not all. Um, we will have a wrap from uh, Annika at the end and you're invited to stay around from drinks, for drinks and really um, take the opportunity. It's a great chance to learn and share and really mingle. Um, we want to create a real community of practice around this gender lens work in giving, and um, often those relationships are what will kick things off really well. Um, we've got a wonderful audience here, and many of you are known to me, but there's a lot of new faces, and that's very exciting. 
Um, so we've got people from um, corporate philanthropy, from private philanthropy, ESG and CSR experts, SDG um, measurement people. Um, we have Mary Waldridge here from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency and Lisa and Nice um, from the Diversity Council. So you've got some very um, heavy-hitting gender equality people in the room. Um, and so your questions do not have to be limited to the panel. Um, just, just, I didn't check that with you at all, I know, but you'll be fine. Um, so most of you will know the Champions of Change Coalition. Um, there's over 260 members and they engage with leaders to help achieve gender equality um, and in particular a significant and sustainable representation of women in social change. But because you don't necessarily know Australians investing in women, I thought I'd just let you know that we are a national not-for-profit advocate. Our job is to advocate, um, educate and facilitate gender-wise giving and we're a resource for anyone who is working in this space and really encourage you to connect with us. One of the ways that we add value to, the, to philanthropic funders is to create a range of quality initiatives that need support. And um, I'm going to be in trouble with Joyce because I haven't done any flicking through these. <laughs> but one of the things that I'd like everyone to be aware of when they go, it, apart from the resources that are printed out and around for you, is that on our website we have put together some really high-impact projects so that many of you will say we're from very small teams, we don't have a lot of time to navigate the not-for-profit sector and really understand what are the opportunities for investment. So one of the things that we do is that we help put those opportunities together. So we really encourage you um, to, to visit our website. So the work of Wajia in particular provides a great example of the importance of data and data analysis and um, how measurement can be used to drive change. I'm reflecting on how many organisations were very confident and quite insistent that they didn't have a gender pay gap until they had to measure it. Um, so our survey on the state of gender-wise giving, while it's um, voluntary and it's anonymous, has been designed with the same intention, to really invite people to have an intentional focus on women and girls. We're very used to speaking with um, the foundations that are part of Philanthropy Australia. We've got great relationships there. But what we wanted to do was really get the message out more broadly. And so this survey was designed to go to the top 50 corporate funders and the top 50 private funders that um, are published in the Australian Financial Review. And we've invited them to really um, answer a series of, of questions that really make them think about whether how gender equality fits into their strategy. I'm not going to take um, too much of your thunder, Gareth, because I know you've got some really important data to share with us. Um, but partly what we're doing is really challenging the assumption that gender neutral means gender equal. And what we're really doing is asking people to think about how much of your giving targets women and girls or targets men and boys or targets those of diverse gender identity. And if it's not targeted, how well do you, how confident are you that those groups are all benefiting equally from the programs um, that you're funding? And it's by no means an insignificant amount. Um, John McLeod from JB Weir estimates that there's about $5 billion that is given annually by corporates and our interest is to make sure that's as impactful as it possibly can be. And for us that means actually applying a gender lens to your giving. So without further ado, I think we should take a look at the survey data and the insights and then we will move to our conversation about why it matters so much. Um, I wanted to say in one of those pivotal and rather magical moments for our organisation um, back in 2016, one of our then board members was working with Coles and had done a lot of work with this guy that she raved about and um, she really encouraged us to, to really check our own impact 
and to um, invite Gareth to come and help us do some of that. And I have to say it was one of the most fruitful and um, really wonderful, generous connections that we have had. So um, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Gareth Chandler, who is the CEO and founder of the Evolved Group. And I just need you to understand that he has done all of this work for us over a number of years pro bono, and we are so grateful to you. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Julie. And I feel very humbled after that introduction, but I'm also um, honestly extremely grateful for the opportunity to be here today and share some of the findings from our research with, I think, a lot of people in the room have been on this journey at at different stages with the whole uh, movement and and what uh, Julie and the team are trying to do. Uh, What I'd like to really emphasise for today is, I think, where we started, um, where we are now and what we've got to do to get to where we need to go uh, for all of the goals and the ambitions uh, that Australian investing women have. I'd highlight, actually, that when we started, I think it was um, Australian women donors, Julie. So the first thing we looked at back in 2016 was actually the branding, um, and be able to get the brand to be contemporary and relevant and uh, be able to connect with organisations in Australia, both uh, philanthropic trusts but also in terms of, of corporates. Um, and that journey you did actually start with a coffee uh, with Eve and I think Tiz and a few other people down in South Bank in Melbourne. Um, and I think from that first discussion, really understanding um, what, what this organisation can do. And as a father of three daughters and my partner, I'm very passionate about the success and, and it's very pleasing to share some of these results with you today. So what we're really trying to do with these data is to know, as I said before, where things stand Uh, to be able to set a baseline, to be able to define success with hard numbers, uh, to be able to set targets for future success, um, and also be able to find insights that help Julie and the team really accelerate that success so that Australians investing women can have impact in the years ahead um, in the way that we all wanted to. Now, a couple of comments on our survey sample, which, as Julie said before, is based on a, a list of top 50 corporates and philanthropists published in the Australian Financial Review. Um, I'm not sure how people in this room do surveys or not. In fact, when you ask most people if they do the survey, most people say no. Uh, So if you look at a sample size and you say around a third of people uh, completed the survey, that's actually a fairly robust view. Now, we talk about these two groups being large corporates and philanthropic donors as being uh, what you call a finite audience, meaning there's not a lot of them. Um, And if I actually were to say to one of our corporate clients for whom we do business-to-business research, We've just captured 32% of the top 50 companies in Australia. They'd be deliriously happy. So whilst we look at that and say, I would like to see the number 50 up there for both corporates and philanthropic donors, we don't have that. But that's something that we're working on and which uh, Julie and Joyce and the people in her team, we work very closely on that. But I'd like to think if we come back and do this again next year, we'd get that over 20 and every year improve that incrementally. On the other hand, it's still a good sample base um, and it gives us a lot of... uh, Uh, validity to the results and they're quite robust in our interpretation of the data. So the first point that I'll I'll make is that uh, really the journey we're on is what we would call about conversion. And that means what we're trying to do is to make people ensure that the audience for the message of Australian investing women is uh, universally known and then we need to help people understand why it's important. Uh, Once they understand that, we need to help them activate that message and do something about it. Um, And from there, we need them to get them to spread the word and make it stick. So they're the key points that I'm going to go through over the next five to six minutes. And it does start with this chart. So this is at the top of that funnel, if you think about it that way. It's about awareness. Now, I must confess, when I would go back to that coffee back in 2016, I didn't know what gender-wise investing was, and I certainly had never heard of gender-balanced or gender-lens as terms. But uh, obviously, they connected fairly quickly. Uh, I'm pleased to say that seven years later... If we split our sample between corporate and philanthropy, 100% of the people in the survey sample were aware of at least one of those terms. And that's quite an accomplishment because what it means is that it's a foundation for everything that follows in that conversion to get people to understand the message and for corporations to be equipped to do something with it. Behaviour is also changing. So that statement at the top is... Uh, do you apply a gender lens to your community investments and giving? And you can see the number in the blue on the right-hand side is philanthropists. So 40% say they do. 
and 31% on the left-hand side, so they, they do as well in terms of corporates. So if we went back, again, seven years, I, we didn't track that number from the start of the program, but um, I don't think it would be anywhere near that. Uh, we still want it to be higher, but to think that we stand now uh, on the sort of threshold of getting more than a third in the case of corporates and almost a half in the sense of philanthropists on board, that's um, quite an achievement. And if we look forward uh, even more, there's, there's more good news on the horizon. So what this chart shows is uh, the same number on the, on the previous slide, where we've got the 31% and 40% for both the audiences. The little sliver here, that's the proportion of organisations that indicate they're going to be implementing a gender-wise um, approach to a gender lens on their community investment giving in the next uh, 12 months. Even more exciting, if you look the one underneath it, you've got 19% and 20% respectively who say they're under consideration. So that's the immediate audience that we need to focus on to make the maximum difference in terms of getting what I would think, if you draw a line halfway down the page, the total number over 50%. Now, my, my theory is, and it's something that I think would probably be proven right, is that once you get to a certain threshold, it starts to take off. You get traction. People here, other organisations are doing the same thing, and it moves from being something where people are forward-leading to people feel like they better get on board because if they're not doing it, they feel like the ones who are left out, not the other way around. So uh, I think we're closing in on the point where we're going to get traction and where organisations, uh, both philanthropists and corporates, are going to feel like if they're not doing this, they're part of the exception, not the rule. So what do we need to do to make that happen? So it's not just the words, it's also actions. And I think this really sums it up as a statement, which is an individual is a conscious of the impact of gender. The challenge is translating this into organisational thinking. So if we go back to that statistic on several slides back, we've got universal awareness now, and that's great. But as we all know, working in corporate, in large organisations and with large organisations, intent doesn't necessarily translate into action, and that's what we've got to focus on. The first one being we have to drive change from the top. And this is something, again, we've learned from all the programs we run in corporates around Australia and overseas, that leaders within organisations, when they believe in a message, uh, people do it. Um, so it has to be led by the leaders in an organisation. At the moment, 50% of our sample indicated they agree uh, with the statement, leaders within the organisation advocate, advocate for gender-wise approach. So there's work to be done there. And the point is that you can't ask others to do what you don't do yourself. Uh, so leaving this room today, I would encourage everybody to spread the word and, again, make others in leadership positions in this country understand what we're trying to do. The next one is around organisational capability. Um, the question we asked here was, or we asked respondents to agree or disagree to, is we have systems and processes that support us in taking a gender-wise approach. Now, this number is lower than the previous one, so just about a third of respondents said that that was the case. Now, why is that important? It's important because if we rely on goodwill, then it's not going to stick. So even if those changes are made and we get to the point of having organisations taking action and using gender-wise investing principles, then we might come back in four or five years and when those people move on, uh, we'll lose that traction in market. So we also have to have a foundation of policy. So uh, the statement we asked here was organisation has a stated commitment to gender equity when making decisions about community investments and giving programs, about 43% invested in that statement. And the reason that's important is that we have to engage hearts as well as minds. So if people believe in what we're trying to do and it's not just being told what to do or they feel that it's something the organisation just uh, becomes ticking boxes, as important as that might be, uh, it's something that they will again pass on to others and it will get its own life um, and start to self-propagate through organisations. Julie mentioned this before, and I can't emphasise uh, this um, enough and probably at risk of being self-referential with presenting the survey data, but really what it comes down to is the concept of measurability and acquittal and helping organisations understand why gender-wise investing matters because it has a disproportionate impact in terms of the outcomes of giving. It's that simple. So when we read that statement, we support our recipients to report on the use of the funds when receiving respect to gender. It's of concern that only 30% say that they're able to do that. And we all know, and there's different ways that we can phrase this, but what gets measured gets done. So if we can help organisations be able to measure the impact 
of gender-wise investing, then we'll be able to make them feel that their message is being heard and that we're seeing actions. So, last but not least, to all those organisations that did take part, uh, we have something to give you, which is a benchmark against your key results against those who also gave feedback uh, through our research. And for me, this is super important because, again, it's about being able to say, how do we compare to the guys down the road or the people down the road? How is our organisation shaping up on those criteria such that looking ahead in 12 months, that gives you the basis for action to be able to define something you can look back and say, well, we changed that, we measured it, and now we can see the results of that in every aspect of what we do within this organisation. So um, last thing I'll say is thank you to Julie and everybody at Australian Investing Women. It's been a pleasure to be on the journey and I look forward to uh, more positive news in the years ahead and I uh, appreciate everybody's time today. Gareth, thank you so much. And I also want to thank Giz and Sue, who are either side of um, Gareth and have, with Ella and Joyce, been doing um, the hard work around this. Uh, we think this is a really great value add. Um, so you will only get this report, and you will get it in the next few days, if you actually completed the survey. So part of our purpose today is really to say, OK, we're going to come back to you next year. Um, John McLeod tells me that I think December they're publishing a new list and we will be on to that. So we really encourage you for your own um, benefit and your own understanding of what you're doing um, to, to really take part in this. It's really helpful data. So um, you will have a chance to ask Gareth some questions afterwards, but we really wanted to get to the conversation. Um, and so it's my pleasure now... Um, to introduce to you our panellists. Um, our chair, um, Sam Moston, who is such a powerful change maker across so many different mediums um, and has been helping drive equality for women, working with First Nations equity and climate justice for such a long time. I'm guessing most of you Sydney people know her really well. Um, but Sam has... Um, just made a world of difference uh, leading our organisation. And Sam, I'm going to invite you to take the middle seat if you are happy to do that. Um, so please uh, welcome Sam to the stage. I don't think it's any secret to the people in this room that Sam has been instrumental in leading the, work, um, the federal government's work on Women's uh, Economic Equality Task Force. And we've got some of that information here for you also. Uh, so we're doubly blessed um, to have the generous support of Catherine Fox, who is also a board director for Australians Investing in Women. She's a Walkley Award-winning journalist, an author and an expert moderator. Um, so, Catherine, I'm going to suggest you um, take a seat to the right of Sam. Thank you so much. And joining Catherine and Sam, I'm really delighted to introduce Ian Silk, who will be known, best known to most of you as the former head of Australian Super and is now the chair of Crown Melbourne um, and is a recognised expert for his leadership in ESG, all things ESG and investment. So please make Ian very welcome. <laughs> I should just say, Catherine, um, before I hand over that, my first meeting with Ian was back in 2019 when uh, Lisa Whiffen and I went along. One of the beautiful things about the Champions of Change is that they have a philosophy of listen, learn and um, lead from there. And so uh, we went along to Ian to say, look, this is who we are, what we do, it's what we're trying to achieve. We really think there's a great opportunity for corporates who are doing great work within their HR and D&I areas, but not necessarily thinking about how that gender lens works um, across their community investment and their giving. And I remember sort of making this sound very important to Ian, and he looked at me very um, directly and said, well, it's a bit of a no-brainer, isn't it, Julie? <laughs> so that was they've become famous words to us, Ian, and it was really what gave us... Um, the, the licence and enthusiasm to go ahead and to really try and unlock that. So, Catherine, I will hand over to you to lead the conversation and thank you very much. I have, 
had an editor when I started out in journalism who said, you're not cynics, you're healthy sceptics. Um, so the healthy sceptic journalist here um, looks at that and thinks, fantastic, because some of those, uh, that familiarity with some of those uh, terms has certainly increased, um, even to that 100% um, level uh, with the philanthropic group. So that's fantastic to see, because it certainly wasn't the case a few years ago, and uh, we, we all know that because we've been in this space for a while. However, um, it's about, that's the theory, um, it's about the practice. So what we'd like to cover today is how does that translate? So you've heard the term, you sort of understand that it's, it's not sort of, you, you probably understand, it sounds like a, a terrific thing. Uh, it's a no-brainer, as Ian put it. But how do you put that into practice? What does it involve? So I thought to kick us off it might be good, um, and I might start by asking Sam to talk a little bit about what indeed is a, a gender lens or a, a, one of those expressions? How does it apply? And given that her work with the task force has um, just culminated in the report, which has been handed to government, and I was refreshing my memory going through it today, and I must say, um, as a bit of a, can I say a veteran? Yeah, a veteran of this space, as indeed um, are, are some of us in the room. Um, it is so refreshing to see something that um, not only reflects an enormous amount of work, but is a very sophisticated framework uh, that finally um, says that women's rights are not special needs. Uh, they are actually have to be woven through our entire economy. Um, so I thought it might be worthwhile, Sam, talking to us, and I know you did months of work on this, so I am asking you to slightly do the impossible, but give us a sense of, of what the information was that you collected and why those outcomes are so important once you take into account the needs of women and girls. Well, thank you, uh, Catherine. It's, it's always wonderful to be on a panel with Catherine because you know you're in very expert hands. And um, Catherine also has a link to some of the work that kicked a lot of this off, which is your daughter is a gender economist and at Deloitte. And, and so is Rhiannon. Are they here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, because um, long before we first met as a task force, um, AIW, together with, Del um, with Deloitte, had published the groundbreaking piece of work that actually put a value on the missed opportunity of not utilising the full skills of women in Australia and, and were able to deliver that $128 billion miss to the economy. So it was, there was a wonderful framing uh, from the economics of this that said, back to that comment at the opening, being gender neutral does not actually leads to um, gender discrimination. And in this country, I'm looking at Mary and so many people around this room who are experts. I'm going to get a lot of this not quite right, but the experts are in the room. But we're probably the most gendered, normed um, country, certainly in the OECD, possibly in the broader world. And we, have, we, te we tend to just accept that as part of the cultural norm of this country, that uh, women and men do different things, that um, women are the carers, um, take on the burden of under or unpaid work, 90% um, of the care sector is generally performed by a woman, very rarely at full pay and very rarely properly recognised as care that's worth paying for. Um, most of the high paying equity building, career building roles and uh, sectors are held by men in this country. And when people visit Australia, they often comment, particularly if they're from um, the US, Europe and Asia, that when they first come to see Australia and walk into a, a business or into a party, they're struck by how gendered we are, that it's, it's visible, that the, the division of work, the way the language works, um, and that women do seem to have um, been pushed into the caring side of things. And when you look at the data that backs that in, it is truly um, horrifying. And particularly for a woman like me, sort of pushing up towards that dreaded six in front of a decade at some point in the next couple of years, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, when you start to think about a lifetime of being in the workforce, and I have a 23, a 24 year old daughter, and you think that, that we've actually been making quite a lot of progress, and then you get stuck into the data and you realise that this country really does not value women, and if you're just gender neutral about this, then we are, we are we're involved in a persistent loop of holding women back. And it acts as discrimination, as um, systemic holding back, um, we know the reasons for it. We can now measure it. Um, and so by being very, very um, particular in the work that uh, Senator Katie Gallagher asked us to do as a, um, a task force, it was 13 of us, um, so quite a, quite a wrangling exercise. But the, the women on that, uh, on that task force ranged from the head of the ACTU 
to the head of the BCA, to gender um, um, academics, to people with women who knew about women with disability, First Nations women, um, chief economists. You know, it was it was quite a range, um, and so everything we were doing. Um, there was no starting point that said, oh, this is what big business sees or this is what the trade union movement sees. We were looking at the data through the lens of 13 women then supported by the women who and their organisations who gave us their stories um, about the persistent, deep discrimination against women across the entire economy. And I had to keep reminding myself that I just was not normal, that the way my life course had taken, the partner I'd been lucky enough to choose in life who was happy to, to take time out of his career to help raise our daughter. All the things that I kind of took for normal were not normal things happening for most families and for most women. So um, it was important to then hear those stories. Um, we also had on our, um, on our panel the head of the Single Mothers Association of Australia, um, Therese um, Edwards. And Therese proved to be a lightning rod in the very first meeting to say, you've got to be on to the things that we don't acknowledge by not having a gender lens. So she made it quite clear that our work, if it was to be successful, needed to look at those cohorts of women who suffer the most exquisite and deliberate and compounding forms of discrimination and therefore are, are, are well and truly out of our, our economic consideration a lot of the time. And typically that was a single mother. And she forced us in, a, in the best possible way to actually understand what, what we mean when we say single mother, single parent, and how loaded that description is and how policymakers and others have often thought about if you, if you picture a single mother, for many policymakers in Canberra who've been working in departments of social security and the like, there was a picture of that woman that is not the picture of a single mother in this country and, and never was, but you'll know what it is. It's a malingering, doll bludging, probably not very well educated, probably got herself into trouble early, probably had too many children. Like there's a series of things that you, you feel and you know probably from the conversations when you hear about single mums. And, and it was no surprise then that one of the first things we recommended was the reinstatement of the, um, the parent payment single to parents who had children up to the age of 14 still at home. Because when that was taken away uh, 13 years ago, it was because there was a feeling that these were this was welfare that was being wasted on these women, mendicants, um, who weren't helping the economy um, and nothing could have been further from the truth in terms of what, what was really going on. And so I think I use that example about the single mums um, because by actually fixing that persistent problem, calling out the, ideo the ideology behind that and actually saying meeting single mothers from, and single parents from across the country, you discover highly intelligent, highly educated women who in many cases were escaping violent relationships, living in circumstances with their children in poverty, not able to get jobs, and all said to us, we want to be the best parents, we want our children to have the best starts. We'd like to be taxpayers. We don't want to be regarded as drains on the Australian economy in the way we've been described. And it was a, it was a, a message that we kept getting. And to me, that's the epitome of the gender lens because if you don't step back and say, who is this group of women? How have we demonised them? How have we described them? What's that done to policy? Um, and how have we then affected the entire community? Because the lack of productivity for those women not being able to get jobs, their children's future, so if they're living in poverty, not eating well, um, not have a secure home, they're starting school poorly. So that's then part of the next story about the future productivity of the nation, put at risk because we couldn't put a gender lens on and say, what is it about this cohort of women that led to where they are, but also the policy response. So that, that to me is an example, but, the, but our report is littered with <laughs> stories of those kind of persistent um, barriers. And we also heard from lots of men that we needed to call this out as a 10-year plan for an economic, a better economic future for the country so that men had permission to be stronger allies and could actually start talking about the, the way in which these tight gendered norms were affecting their lives. And so whether Ian might have views on this as to the men who want to be active parents um, or men who want to take time to be um, to, to take time off and develop themselves and, and are happy for um, their partner, a woman, to be a higher income earner or to stand up and be an ally for women in the workplace when they see bad things happening. It, and so, so much of this plan is about um, equality and opportunity, but not failing the test of calling out what must change. And so there are big systemic reforms here. Um, we, we did it over a 10-year cycle, so we've said what has to happen now, what could happen over the next two to three years, 
another government, another parliament, um, and by the end of 10 years, could we describe the Australia that we might have created against five dimensions um, and we would look like a very different place um, that would have intentionally removed those barriers for women and girls but would have benefited the whole community. And um, reading through the report and the short-term and longer-term recommendations, and I was saying something uh, about this to Ian on a sort of a slightly more micro scale, it's so apparent, isn't it, that some of the change that has happened, not enough, but it's been piecemeal. So it's been in particular areas. Um, and even thinking about uh, the PPL and the failure to, to actually pay superannuation during that period. Yeah. And I know that's you know one of, one of many recommendations. But it just strikes me, looking through that again, that the need to pull this together and to look at it, uh, it in the broadest possible way, and the 128 billion figure, which yep. of course reflects how many of our population are missing out. You know, it's a, it's a huge figure. No, and that's right. That. The, the thing that, um, and we did call this out, and I think it, that's back to this lens and how you look intentionally. Um, we were able to show that um, we are underutilising 50% of the of the available population. So that's just a staggering figure of laziness. But until you look at it, you don't get to be able to confirm that. 30% of men in the country today say there is no gender inequality. 30%. So in terms of the messaging and the who are we trying to bring along, an, an economic story makes a lot of difference. But when you think about the fact that in Australia today, 70 to 75 per cent of all part-time work is done by a woman. And think about what that means in terms of job security, career, um, a sense of income, um, where you end up at the end of your, your life. And we've, we've pointed out and we've, we've charted what you give up if you've had to pay the motherhood or pen, um, parenthood penalty when you have children, but then you go back to work and then you start doing part-time and then you're piecing together a whole lot of other part-time work because no one part-time job is enough and you're taxed in a way that slugs you because you are a woman. So we've called out the tax and transfer system, which again, was seen to be gender neutral, but when you get in under the tax and transfer system, this is a pernicious system that punishes women who try to come back to work after having children. The tax rates mean, and uh, yeah, there have been some good writing about this recently, that you pay to go back to work. Um, because it, it hasn't been thought through the lens of what it means to be a parent going back to work. And, and so then you end up with 70% of the country's part-time workers are women, and you wonder why um, so many women over 55 end up homeless or without any superannuation savings um, and are couch surfing, um, but looking after many other people in that predicament and dealing with the issue of, um, of safety and domestic and, and sexual violence. So, um, but when you pull it all out, there is a, there's a fantastic story that if you focus on the things that, that are creating those barriers, we can fix this in a decade. Um, it will require investment, it will require some bravery, and, a, and I talk about it, it requiring a real audacity um, of policy making and measurement rather than just ambition, because to date, um, the, the way in which we've dealt with this in a piecemeal fashion incrementally um, has not worked, and it has to, that has to stop. Thanks, Sam. Um, now, Ian. Um Superannuation, <laughs> your, your time at um, Australian Super. Tell us a little bit about um, being within um, an organisation um, and building the case to apply a gender lens. Um, you were a champion of change at the time. How do you do that? How do you make sure that people are listening and that it's applied consistently? Um, at this point, not talking specifically about corporate foundations, but throughout the organisation and making that a focus point. Okay. Um, first of all, can I thank uh, Julie and Annika for inviting me to this session. Uh, every time I'm involved in a discussion on this, I feel not a fraud, but I feel as though I'm learning more than I'm contributing. I suspect that'll be the same again today um, because there are so many uh, incredible thinkers and practitioners in this field, in this room, including uh, Sam, who's just a, a hero of mine's fantastic. And that two at a four sort of <laughs> summarising uh, all that work just in that five minutes was great, Sam. Uh, so leadership, like you're all leaders in, in one form or another and you know the, the, the basics of leadership, but leadership on gender is an interesting issue because, as Sam said, um, most of the power structures in society have men disproportionately represented in leadership positions. Um, but my experience is that most men are not um, capriciously anti-women. They're not misogynistic. They're just unthinking. And 
I was fortunate to, when, you, when you're embarking it, uh, it's, it's too big a thing to say um, a social change in the organisation, but when you're embarking on this sort of um, approach, it's aided dramatically by the sort of organisation you're in, if it's a, an organisation that's conducive to that. So most industry superannuation funds, not all of them, but the vast majority are progressive organisations and they attract progressive thinkers. Not a universal rule, but certainly true generally. So it, there's a pretty fertile group to be sort of sowing these seeds that I and a number of other people in the organisation did. Um, but can I just talk about leadership in the context of this specific issue? Um, you all have, I think you're all, you're all in, in different roles in, I think, principally corporate foundations or philanthropic organisations. You've got considerable authority, but I would suggest if you're not getting the traction in your organisation, and the data suggests that we're a long way from getting universal, much less, uh, substantial uh, traction, much less universal traction, seek out the most senior person who does have a gender lens, the most senior person in the organisation that is the gender champion. It might be the chief executive, but it might be another executive on the executive committee. It might be a director that's dragged the management along, but identify who that person is, because if that person is a champion for um, applying a gender lens across the organisation, whether it be employment or um, whatever the case may be, that's the person that you want to be championing this issue so that this issue can become part of the organisation's approach to gender. And it's, it's not left to you to make all the running on the issue. Get that person involved. And if that person starts from the position of being uh, a gender lens champion, why would they not uh, add this to their their kit bag and, and therefore have the organisation committed to it. So I do think, and one of Gareth's um, slides indicated the importance of leadership. This is true of, and we all know this, this is true of any issue. Any issue where you're seeking to affect change needs leadership. It doesn't have to be the chief executive, although it generally will and hopefully will because that person has the organisational authority to uh, promote issues and dedicate resources and champion the issue. But think carefully, because it might not be the chief executive. Who is the gender champion? Can you get them on this journey? And just quickly, the, um, the other part of this is data. Now, I've, I've been surprised doing s some more research um, on, on this issue in preparation for this discussion. There is so little data, not just on an organisation providing money to the recipient organisation, but really when you're fixing a problem or addressing a problem, you want to have some sense of what the problem is. There's so little data about the, gender, the negative gender effects of the current system. Now, intuitively, I think we know it to be so, rather than think it to be so. It must be the case because it's just a manifestation of broader societal inputs. But the people who are not naturally attracted to this issue, from a philosophical point of view, will need to be convinced. And the best convincing, of course, is data. Now, if the data doesn't exist, I'd be taking to the champion some work you've done based on a range of assumptions because that's data. might not be real data, might not be substantiated, but until it's disproven and it's based on reasonable assumptions, it's something. That's one element of data. The other element, which is much easier, frankly, is the, organ the giving organisation to the recipient organisation and determining what sort of data you want back in return to prove that the, um, the grant or whatever the contribution has been utilised effectively. I think that's much easier. But if you're coming up with uh, coming up against sceptics or cynics, um, data will be really important to get them over the line, assuming they don't start from a position of intuitively supporting this proposition. Yeah, how? 
a very good point. And I uh, do eventually express a community of practice. And mm. I think um, the champions of change, being a that terrific example of that, because I was saying to you earlier, the fact that an old framework has to extend the supplier multiplier and a number of the other uh, that mechanisms and levers that were developed by campaigns of change means that you can share some of that IP. So you're quite right about about uh, but at least talking to a group of people who are philosophically on board about how to, to a to identify this, but then how to go about actually putting it into practice uh, is obviously more than two. Well. It is, and um, so Julie referenced the discussion, which I, I must say I hadn't recalled where I said, oh, it's whatever I said, it's obvious or whatever. Um, it is, and everybody in this room knows that exceptionally well, but where are we? That, was, that discussion was five or six years ago, and are we dramatically further advanced? Well, there's a lot of shaking of heads. Clearly the answer is no. So this is an issue that requires action now. Um, there's awareness, the point um, again that Gareth raised. The question asked was, are people aware of those three terms? Well, it's a pretty low bar and the f figures are still very low. So it requires those of us slash you who've got some impetus, some interest in this issue to push hard. Now, I don't want to be accused of saying this is a women's problem, women should fix it. But I'm just saying the people in this room do have an interest in the issue, do have a voice, and if you don't think you've got sufficient voice in your organisation, as I said, seek out the champion so that we can move from having discussions and fora where we discuss this issue, where we can come and celebrate great successes, because that's what we want to do. And I'll, I'll speak a little later about one of the, the means I think that we might be able to use to do that. I love that you took us to um, data, um, Ian, and I thought it would just be useful to let you know that in our first set of recommendations, the so number one, which is really about the government having to implement gender responsive budgeting and policy making. If you, if you just change the words from government to business or right. foundation, and as I read this, you might think about that in your terms. And whilst I read about the lack of data that's obvious, the data holdings, and so to this from the government, are extraordinary, that the secrets and the stories that are contained in data that has not been leaked by governments is extraordinary. And I suspect that's the same in some organisations. I think it's, it's thinking about what does data tell us and, and in what form. Yeah. And so we've said, um, as, a, as one of the immediate priorities for government, is to improve the use of the data that they already have that's currently available, collect new data and build the right toolkit to present an accurate and nuanced understanding of the dimensions of gendered economic inequality in Australia. This includes setting an expectation of evidence-based policy development and investing in the data capabilities of the APS to build, collect and use gender disaggregated data sets. Now, if the government just did that, I know Mary would know all about this from the work that you do with, uh, with GIA, the, the data that you could bring across from the, um, the, the longest health surveys that's ever been held in the world, the women's health surveys that have been done for 40 or 50 years, you begin to see the path of women and, and you can link all this data to say, when do women start um, falling out of the economy? And what happens to their health? And what's happening to the health budget as a result of that? And then what's happening to their children while they're having that moment? And that data is all collected by federal and state governments. It's just not linked. And so we've made a very strong case for that. And I think in our own corporate organisations, if you ask a different set of questions, um, and the one we put here was um, to legislate to integrate gender impact assessment and gender responsive processes into policy design, legislative processes and budgeting, but we said particularly around diverse groups of women and ensuring that gender equality is foregrounded in the work and investments of government. Again, put that into the language of business, so foregrounded the investments of business and foundations. This requires an intersectional approach and you should, it should always improve, not worsen, the lives of women and that imperative should un underpin the work of central and service delivery arms. So it forces you to then go looking in your organisation if you do foreground the gender issues and those things that have held women back. Mm. You'll make di different decisions in your organisations or in your giving about where you can have the most profound effect um, that's having positive impact elsewhere. But in many cases, your giving and government's work on service delivery is actually harming women. So that, that was the other thing we found, that by that lack of intentionality, the lack of use of data yeah. and understanding what the data is telling you can lead to policies that actively um, work to disadvantage women and therefore just families. Just to be clear, I was talking about lack of data and oh, no, no, I, to giving, 
not. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. But I think if you go looking for data, I, th I think there's, a, there's an obligation on all of us to go looking for more data, because I, I agree with you that that's part of the problem we find whenever we survey, that people don't know. But um, maybe we're looking, you know, we've got to start looking in other places, or find the data sets that tell us. You know, I, I'm staggered with, with foundation giving that it's so hard to say, think about yeah. your giving from a perspective of how women and girls will benefit from your yeah. giving, and yet we don't, we don't do it. It's, I find it this is fascinating culturally. Yeah. Can I? Yes, go. So the point I was going to raise, magnificent segue, um, I think corporate foundations and philanthropic organisations undersell to themselves the power they have. You're the ones with the power, i.e. money. There's a range of organisations, you know better than me, there are more organisations that want your money than there are organisations providing it. You, that power needs to be leveraged. And one of the ways to leverage it, apart from the actual doing of good by the recipient organisation, is the data transfer back to you if, if you're interested in this sort of issue. I, um, one of the organisations, charities that I support is a, I won't mention it, but a household name, like one of, if I was to ask you what it would be, you'd get it in two guesses, I think. And I contacted them in the last couple of days to ask whether, what their approach was to gender-based analysis of all the work they do. S staggeringly, they have none. Now, now they're a recipient of um, money from principally government, but but many other organisations. If I can just give you an example of the authority, the power that you do have. In 2016, Australian Super wrote to all of the companies in the ASX 200, the 200 largest companies listed on the stock exchange, that had no women directors. There were 17 of them. And said, we are going to vote at the next director election against the chair of the board or the chair of the nomination committee, and if neither of them are up, we'll vote against whoever's next until you address this. Today, there are no ASX director companies that have no directors. And I should say, um, this is not all of Australian Super's doing, because there are many organisations who've been championing this, including um, the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors for a long period of time. But I think we were the first organisation to write to chairs and say, we are going to use our economic power as shareholders in your company with the power to vote you off the board unless you do something about this issue, which has persist persisted for decades. In 2020, we wrote to the 37 companies on the ASX that had only one director and said our policy is that it should be a min minimum of two directors, hardly a huge ask. Um, Today, there are four companies in the ASX 200 that have only one director. And in January of next year, Australian Super is going to write to um, all of those same companies and say, we'll be voting um, until you get to 30% women. So you might say it's a slow march from 2016, but um, it's an example of an organisation using its financial muscle and believe me, you've got a power of financial muscle. Using it responsibly, I think, because we didn't say we're going to vote at the next election. We're happy to engage with you if you've got a plan in place, all that sort of business. But there have been many times where Australian Super over the journey has voted people off the board or lodged a vote to that effect because we had the power to do so. And um, you spoke just now, Sam, about how staggering it is that culturally these big organisations, giving organisations, do not make an entirely reasonable request of the organisation that, that probably hasn't thought about this issue itself, but putting it in their consciousness, having it as a contractual obligation, they'll provide the data back and the flywheel effect of the momentum that that will provide, I think, would be very significant. Absolutely. I think um, 
We will open up in a minute, but I was just going to mention a few examples, which I think are always uh, illuminating. Of course, the principle here is that you apply the gender lens uh, to all your giving. Uh, so we look at, and we have many examples, you saw some uh, on Julie's slides, um, but programs, very well-intentioned programs, and by the way, that funnily enough can be part of the problem, if you like, or one of the stumbling blocks, because philanthropists are doing good work, um, and so when we say, but actually you could make this much more impactful for women and girls, it can sound a bit negative, but what we're actually saying to them is do examine um, the parameters and who's benefiting. Um, and one of the ones that we often go back to is a wonderful program that was set up for Indigenous teens, uh, and it was after school sports, um, but there was no provision for young women, so no proper changing rooms and so on. So the people who were benefiting from that incredibly um, worthwhile scheme were young men. Um, so we're not saying they shouldn't benefit, but we're saying with some tweaks to that, you can make that so much more impactful. Um, but I did want to mention a couple of um, uh, things that we've watched and, and used as examples. Uh, Women for Election and Pathways to Politics, which I'm sure all of you are aware, well, look at what happened in our last federal election. I'm not, not saying it was entirely from them, but gosh, that had an impact. Um, and they continue to do wonderful work. And if anyone's wondering, are, are women less likely to want to go into politics? I hear from them that they're actually inundated with women, int interested in local government, state, federal. Uh, so they're going gangbusters. They're running workshops all around Australia. So that's one of them. Um, the other one's the Stella Prize, uh, which we often point out, which has absolutely transformed the literary landscape. Um, the number of books by women that are reviewed, um, reading lists and high schools, and the absolute resonance that has and the shift in, in young women who and their reading and the people that they are, are turning to uh, for wise words um, is just phenomenal. So just a couple of examples there. Um, Sam, I don't know if there's any you want to throw in, but our point being that you can go to very specific areas of philanthropy um, and, and you can apply the lens in a more generic sense as well. I might just use one that was, um, I remember being profoundly affected by it when I first joined the board of then Women Donors Network um, that Eve Marlab had created and Julie was, was running. And it was this issue of how medical research spending was done in this country. And to discover that uh, there was no distinction made between research on heart and heart health between men and women. And so all the research was done on men's heart health and the prescribing of um, heart medication had not been interrogated properly, so women were being misdiagnosed, or sorry, misprescribed the wrong quantities of, 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 of life-saving medication because no one had thought to actually separately investigate um, the effect of heart health. And what's the, what's the biggest killer of women in this country today? Heart disease. It's not breast cancer, it's, it's heart disease that kills more of us because there was a different, it was, it was, breast cancer was seen as ours and hearts probably as men. There was probably something in the culture around that. And so the money was pouring into research that, that didn't have an intentional gendered lens. And then, then you see the outcome of it. And that's a, that's a pernicious one because that then goes to our, our ability to, to live good lives and have good medical support. And the research community is full of those kinds of examples. I've, I've met the, all the ones about how, how seat belts are designed and how, how airbags are designed without um, women with the bits that we have compared to men. Uh, really serious stuff, though, about our safety because of a lack of intentional look. And that's just about giving and more about focus. But yeah. you can draw that across to say, how do people get into their head not to ask the question, should we be looking at this through the... The one about, I can't resist putting in the one about um, safety devices in cars when that was first being noted that more women were being seriously injured and indeed dying in car accidents. Uh, it was attributed to their poor driving skills. <laughs> True story. Um, but also, uh, uh, just something that sprang to mind, because I heard Carolyn Criado Perez, who wrote the extraordinary book Invisible Women, talking again quite recently um, about PPE during COVID and how it was all designed for male norms. So the masks didn't fit. Women were actually catching COVID, uh, women working in essential areas clearly, uh, because the equipment and the masks and so on were not designed for women. So some incredible yeah. stuff that's- fun. I'll share one that was more about philosophy and received wisdom um, that was never really checked. And we heard about this in the work we were doing when we looked at the role of um, paid parental leave and how was the original paid parental leave scheme designed and where? And because we've pushed very hard for it to be extended and paid at replacement wage, not just at minimum wage and super to be paid on it. But when we're looking at how it was, how did it come to be that so, many, so few men 
take up the paid parental leave scheme paid for by government. Um, and there were many reasons, but one that men told us was that they didn't want to actually line up for a Centrelink number because the, way, the mechanism by which PPL is generally paid, unless your employer does it, is through a Centrelink number. So it's paid through Department of Social S uh, Security. And so men said, I'm not, sorry, I, I don't, don't take payments from Centrelink. That's for, put any words you like in, dole bludgers, people who draw down on, on Australia's wealth, that's not me. At the time, the bureaucrats considered whether it would be mandated to be paid through employers and payroll or through Centrelink. And because they came to the view, it was a group of men, came to the view that it was a welfare payment, not an economic productivity payment. So if you'd thought about it as a productivity payment, you'd say you want this to feel like a wage and a replacement for the... And, and saying you're doing important work while you're not at your other job, that's part of the economy and we'll pay it that way. But because it was for women, it was seen as, as, as a, an assistance package. It was part of the payment system. It was welfare. And if you're a welfare recipient, you'll, go to, you'll get a Centrelink number. And so how does that change the notion of how people feel comfortable about taking a government payment rather than an investment in your, your time out? And, and so but that persisted for a very, very long time until someone said, it's not a welfare payment. <laughs> Paid parental leave is one of the greatest lifts of economic productivity in this country. And, um, and the delightful um, Angela... Um, I'm going to forget Angela Jackson, thank you. Angela Jackson was able to show about the $4 billion per annum increase in Australia's productivity once the paid parental leave scheme was, was up and running because it was, it was just changing families' lives and um, it's why we've asked for the removal of the activity test for childcare and all sorts of things that, that are sitting there that actually speak to some assumptions made about women in our lives, in our communities. And you pull that back and say, actually, if it's all about us being productive and... And, and wanting to be part of a um, of the success of a nation and building a nation, you would describe these things very differently. And philanthropy, of course, has some, a very important role to play in, in so many of these elements. Um, unconscious time's ticking on. Um, some fantastic messages here about getting active, um, gender neutral not being gender equal, and I think Ian's point about finding who the gender champion is. Hopefully the CEO, but if not, finding those, those people that you can go to, and then the data, the capturing of the data, and passing that message on. So I'm going to open up. Um, any questions, comments, um, really, anything? Yes. So Leila Naja Hipri from the Australian Fashion Council. Uh, thank you so much for that very interesting uh, panel discussion. Sam and Ian, this question is for both of you. It's more of a, I'm, I, I wonder what's going on. It's almost 2024. Um, the Australian fashion and textile industry is, about, makes, uh, is worth about $27.2 billion and employs about half a million Australians. And from the work that we've done, um, the half, uh, there's about 77% uh, women working in the industry, so predominantly uh, empowered by women at very senior, also uh, uh, executive roles, so on. But then when it comes to C-level roles and board roles, we don't have um, parity, definitely not, and we, we don't even have, in some instances, representation. And so I've looked at some of the data uh, from Wijia on that. I've also, uh, the, the industry is uh, predominantly made up of SMEs and so there's a lot of private companies that don't have to report on this. So what is going on? And you know, there are stats saying that, so representation and merit cannot be used in this case at all. And then the stats about uh, you represent on the board so that you can obviously have that diverse and inclusive voice and how it is well known that the more, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's been recorded and, and said that uh, the more diversity and inclusion, uh, there, there are uh, positive economic benefits to companies. So all those stats are there. All that information is there, right? Why don't we have um, representation in such an industry, for example? <laughs> Come on. Well, first of all, I don't know. Uh, I don't but it is the existential question. And it was the, the, um, my response to Julie those years ago. It's, um, look, I don't know. It's been incredibly unhelpful for a response. But, 
but that's what it is today. And I know the industry reasonably well because virtually the whole industry was um, part of Australian super, so I've known it for some time. Um, but so that's the history. We are where we are. We can't change the history. It is now, I'm this now, I should say, but it is up to those of us who have an opportunity to make a difference to identify the causes for that and then seek to address them. And that the causes are societal and they're um, community thinking, they're things that you could just can't change tomorrow. But in each of our areas, we've got an opportunity to change. The um, champions of change, frankly, haven't yet made a significant change in the economy or in the workforce would be my view, a long way from that. But what most of them have done, those organisations have, I would say, in my experience at least, certainly in the Australian Super, but in everyone that I know, didn't dramatically improve their approach to gender representation at executive levels, identification and addressing of gender pay gaps, all of those sort of things. So each of those organisations is in a much better position and hopefully on a continuing trajectory to address the, the um, negative gender issues that exist in those organisations. We've spoken about a couple of opportunities that people in this room can use to address it. Um, in terms of, you've got role models, not just like Sam, but like so many people in this room. So it is, pro it is improving, it is moving forward but at a glacial pace. And so I haven't been active and uh, an advocate for gender issues for decades, like some people in this room have been. And I said to Catherine before, that it must be dispiriting. And Catherine said, my up to Or words to that effect. Yeah, words to that effect, yeah. Uh, but what is, the, what is the option? Short, short of... Um, sort of being like the coyote and pressing a TNT and coming up with a whole new paradigm. I'm so, so I'm gonna, I like I, I, so I was, was going to say, I'm with that one. first of all, I'm going to start by saying I have always admired Ian and one of the reasons I was happy to go into the super industry as a chair was having seen the work that you did um, at your time at Oz Super and the way you went about it and the way you dealt with sustainability. And so I've always been a long admirer of yours. So what I'm about to say does not apply to a man like you, <laughs> Ian. Because no, it, is, it is an important question. And this comes to power. This is about the power structures in this country. Um, there's been lots of nice incrementalism. There's been lots of nice getting us to the board. But when we raise our voice, particularly if we're not talking about women's issues, but if we're talking about mainstream business issues, issues that affect the economy, I can't tell you how often we are silenced. The, the systems of power, the systems of communication, who holds power, who seem to hold power in a way that makes value, in this country is still generally a white man. Um, and so when women who step into this space do so at great personal risk, there'll be many of you in the room, like nods, where if you do this, you'll either be slammed on social media, you'll be, um, you'll be called all sorts of things. I've been called um, variously a feminist killjoy. Um, same with Kate Jenkins, because we've called for um, better behaviour at work and, you know, saying how well, you, you know, pinching a bottom and saying, making lewd remarks is not appropriate. But I've heard men say, it was just part of the thing. I can't, why can't we still do that? It was just about admiring women. But if you call it as a woman in an executive role or, I guess, in philanthropy or in the corporate sector, you're on dangerous, you're in dangerous territory. And you've written about this a lot. Um, and I think our country has just got to get on with the project of looking at where... It's not about us having to change. Women don't need to change. The structures of power, the expectations of power, must change. Or else our economy just will not succeed. We will be a lax economy compared to many others close by us in the region who actually w won't, won't misuse or underutilise any resource, including women. And you see women in significant powerful positions in, in countries but, nearby. But, but what, what does that mean practically? Um, I, I actually, well, if I was speaking really, really honestly about what I think men need to do, I think men actually stepping aside to create pathways for women, that does mean giving up some of the big roles. Um, um, it, takes, it takes courage to do that, but men can do that or create roles to make sure that women are seen in very senior positions and are backed. I mean, I, I very rarely get a call from any of my male board colleagues about work I do. Um, 
I'll get inundated with women saying it's great work, but I'll very rarely hear from a man to say, what can yeah. I do to amplify that work? Because I believe in it. But I'll see them and I'll say, thank you for doing it. That's great because I've got daughters. Yeah. And we're yeah. back into the... We're back into the... the wild. And so... Um, I, I, I hope we can have a really important conversation, but you can do it through philanthropy and corporate giving, mm. to actually think about what would change that. Leila, you've done so much work in the fashion industry on sustainability and moving it, but it could be so much bigger if there was grants to the industry to actually back women as leaders um, and women to carry. I, I don't know what that looks like, but if we don't, we, we, need, to, we need to front into it, I think. 85% of this clothing yeah. is bought by women. Mm. So it's actually shooting yourself in the foot economically because you don't have rep representation on those boards. And do you know who taught us most recently how to do this? Anyone else? The Matildas. Yeah. The Matildas. So the Matildas spent years leading up to arriving in Australia for the World Cup. That wasn't left to chance. They had a program of what it would look like to be equal pay in the sporting system, equal broadcast rights, sell out stadiums. That was a plan that had to be negotiated, fixed. Men came along with that in, in, in large numbers. But those stadiums didn't fill because everyone just bought tickets. That was... That was a studied plan and what happened this week, suddenly the Matildas have equal pay under their collective bargaining agreement with the men. Because they, they said that is, the, that is the aim, not to win, they'd love to have won, but it was to get equal pay. Um, and they proved that the economic model that they were promoting for the sport was, had to be supported yeah. by half the population. Um, and they're winning and they, their hashtag is till it's done. Mm. They're not going to stop till it's done. Have they changed the nature of power in soccer? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are they continuing to hold the system, the power to account, so that everyone can play equally? Absolutely. Are they there fully themselves, whereas the men in the game, like men in many of our sports, my favourite sport in AFL, still can't be fully themselves because they're constrained by gendered norms about how those power structures work. But there it was. And, and 11 and a half million people tune in to see a game they hardly know mm -hmm. because the Matildas were activating um, something that I think we could do across industries. So that's what that's what audacity looks like. I think is to and, and to do it in a way that with a big smile. They took us on the most incredible journey about and it what equality. Changed it from something that was not taken seriously. Um, that's I think the point about power, sharing power. And um, you say, Ian, what what would help? It's it's actually listening to us and actually taking our concerns seriously as well. Um, by the way, most of the data um, worldwide, in fact, shows that because the sector is female dominated, does not mean. Uh, that there will be more women. In, in fact, it's, it's depressingly consistent. So it's across health, it's across retail, it's across fashion. All the care, yeah. All the care sectors are run exactly. generally by men, but 90% yeah. of the work underpaid. And, just, and having <laughs> just done some research on uh, organisations, thanks to uh, people like Mary and Annika for giving me some sources, but some of the uh, companies that are doing some great stuff are in male-dominated areas. Um, now, they would be the first to say we're on a bit of a burning platform, which is a particularly appropriate metaphor for a couple of them, um, but they're running out of workers. So actually, they're doing some really interesting stuff. So uh, I'm just saying, it doesn't actually go in, the, in that way, as you know well, yeah. And I was struck at one of your functions recently by how many men um, were coming up and standing on the stage in a female-dominated sector. So yes, um, very, very good point. Oh, I think so many in the room are just feeling that sense of when you talk about uh, the reality and the truth to power kind of conversation, we have that, that feeling of fire in our belly that is combined with the frustration that doesn't go away. Um, I wanted to ask you, though, about the risks around cultural norms and how that plays out in terms of benevolent sexism. And by this I mean we have the idea of sexism, which is women are less than men and we're very familiar with this idea of the way bias comes through in sexism and, and the way women are perceived. I work in a startup environment and it's the whole concept we're very familiar with is, you know, women won't be as good as this as men and so we're very familiar with how to identify that sexism. Benevolent sexism being though, and this is a new body of research that's come out around the idea that people might look at women in what they see as a fav favourable light. Um, women are kind, women are caring, women are nurturing and women need to be protected by men. And that when this uh, insight or perspective of this particular special form of sexism comes in as a, a way we look at women needing that help, needing that protection, that it's not just that women get you know, penalised for it, in fact it's more that men get accelerated for the fact they don't need that protection and that help. So how do we deal with the social norms around this in a context of philanthropy? Where philanthropy and corporate giving is about helping women and about women in need. 
at the same time as trying to drive an agenda where we see women as the hugest economic opportunity in our country. How do we grapple with these two truths? Women, there are women in need, but not allowing people to just see women as needy um, and instead seeing women as a power base. How, how do you suggest we deal with these cultural challenges we face into? I'm just still processing what you've just said. No, because that is such an interesting... Yeah. That is such a duality. I hadn't thought about the combination of the philanthropy versus backing women as... Strong. So I'm, I'm just really struck by the fact that let's look more at that. Let's think about... I don't, know, I don't have the answer. I don't have a clue. No, but, but, I, but what you're touching on is something we must understand because um, even in a world where we think we're helping women, the stats around women and our safety have never been worse. So our security and safety through domestic and family violence and the, the levels of murder. So clearly even thinking of us as needing help and putting money into things like domestic violence is not working. Um, and so, so it's having all sorts of effects that um, we haven't thought about. But I think maybe it's about how do you take a, um, a split view on we're going to help things with need lifting and we're going to help deal with the power structures and we're going to actually back more of this and find, find the discussion in your own... Um, in your own rooms where you're talking about this and be explicit about what an investment in a woman looks like. Mm -hmm. That it's not just about helping, although it can be, um, like the projects, but you can be explicit. I mean, I know um, Kirsty um, is here, Kirsty Albert from Alberts has a, an intentional investment, pro um, an impact investment on women that's, and VCs and startups that's all about pioneers, pioneering women. So, uh, you know, I know I've seen it at work and I know how important it is. I'm lucky enough to be close to the, to that, to the family. But... It does require intention and a purposeful change as to why are we doing this? And if it's easy just to do the ones that have always done, keep doing the helpful stuff, we still need to lift so many women in those circumstances. But Sorry, I'm just going to jump in with um, Nicola. Um, I think the, that's why the point about pathways to politics and women for election is really important. So I absolutely understand what you're saying and I know the term benevolent sexism and I absolutely understand how it operates. But... I do think that philanthropy has a real opportunity to actually get women into power, um, to assist with that. And that's why we use that example, because we've seen it. We've seen it, the traction that it's had. It's changed the political landscape um, and therefore changed outcomes. Um, so that's, a, I think, a very important one. But I think it's also a really good point to make and to remind ourselves of that because the last thing we want to do is to recycle um, that whole idea of women needing to be assisted and having wiser heads making those decisions. That is not the point. So, um, but good, good to think about that. Uh, my name is Alex. I work at Social Ventures Australia and I'm very, very fortunate to have um, a wonderful female CEO, a lot of gender parity at my workplace. So my question is a little bit more across the, um, across the spectrum of, of people here today. Um, I was very fortunate to grow up in an environment, I think Sam, you mentioned, around having uh, my parents work in this space and I uh, have had my mum be the lead parent, my father be the lead parent, um, and the importance and understanding of that that I've had from a very early age. But I've realised as I've continued to grow that that is not something that a lot of other people have experienced. And I think it's so important to, uh, in all the work that we do, to meet people where they're at um, and to make people feel and uh, ensure that people are included in the conversation and to not, not to alienate. Um, and I think I'm really interested in understanding from any of you if what kind of questions or what kind of approaches have you seen work when you are facing people that are maybe not on the same level of understanding, like man-to-man, -man, a conversation that you've had, a, um, you know, having a, an interesting conversation with someone who is from a different... Um, uh, you know, a different, country, uh, a, different, a different country or maybe living, experiencing disadvantage in something that they do. How, how are we having those different entry points of discussion that aren't just leading with data when they may not have the capacity to delve in with you? Um, or, yeah. I want to hear about the man-to-man. -man. I think the man-to-man, <laughs> man -man. yeah. I think so. um, to crocky, these are some pretty penetrating questions. Yeah. Uh, I think one thing I would say is uh, there's a great uh, opportunity for leaders to lead. So, um, so one a micro example that when you find leaders in an org male leaders in an organisation taking parental leave, leaving early, picking up the kids, going to school, all those sort of things that 
some years ago nobody did and now it, it's not common, it's not the norm in, in my experience, but you do see them. And uh, I've seen at uh, a couple of workplaces that I've worked at where the, the people who do that, where the men that do that are, if not in an organisational um, hierarchy, organisation structure terms, the most senior person or the second most senior person, but they're opinion leaders, they're big personalities, they're people that um, are regarded as good managers or good supervisors and people coalesce around them socially, whatever. If they do that, you do see the ripple effect. It does happen. Um, so that would be one... So, uh, here I'm... That's an instance where men influencing men for broader benefit. Um, and, you know, I imagine... I hope others have seen that sort of thing occur. Now, that's not the big issue, but until... The biggest thing for me about... Sort of, we took, took this up to the highest level. The biggest thing for me about what men can do to aid women and um, facilitate a greater gender equity in workplaces is to take more caring responsibilities. And to um, Sam's point about making space for women to step in. And I've seen that happen. It hasn't, in the two organisations I'm thinking of, it hasn't been um, a tsunami of change, but it's, it's a continuing change. So that demonstration effect is something I'd say. I absolutely agree with, with that. At, at Mervac, um, when Sue Lloyd Hurwitz was our CEO, um, as much as women found it a little bit tough at the beginning that we were going to be celebrating the men that were taking leave and doing that, it actually was the most important thing to do and to find the men in that organisation where they were and they were the best role models to allow other men to suddenly find their, um, their courage and their capacity. So they, they were highlighted, their stories were told, and we saw a huge uptick in the number of men who, who started behaving differently. It helped too that they weren't punished at all um, by taking leave in terms of career outcomes. So then that had to be matched by women also not being punished and, and suffering the, the motherhood trap. So it took a lot of work. But I think you're, you, you, you used a phrase which I think is very important. We do have to meet people where we find them. And, you know, I keep, I, I keep relatively calm most of the time. I've given you a little bit of an outburst today just because it's a friendly audience about the power struggle. But um, we chose deliberately to write this report in a particular way so that anyone picking it up could feel attached to it. And I just thought I'd read you the, the, the thing I'm most proud of, which was the, the question we're asking people when they read this, whether they're policymakers, philanthropists um, or, or any of you, was to say when we talked about what was at, what was at risk for the country, we said... This prompts serious inquiry into whether Australia has the necessary social and economic settings to support the modern lives we lead and to be internationally competitive with an economy defined by its diversity, dynamism, resilience and ingenuity. Now, for me, there's a lot of feminism in there, but if we'd made it a feminist document or we'd made it a fight just for women, then the backlash would have been real, it would have been dismissed. But everything in here is a word that's been chosen very carefully to say, if we do this properly, this benefits everybody, and we do talk a lot about the problems of a gendered norm society for men who don't want to be stuck in that in that paradigm and want to be freed, and that what a, what a, what a, ch a change that would be for the for the country. Um, but we are we are using it as a we've got to, we've got to fix this for this country if we're to be internationally competitive, um, and so I think we've got to be careful in language, careful in who we bring up, uh, persistent and purposeful about who we bring along, and then then ask more of each other to actually do the doing, which we've heard today because. We can't keep doing incrementalism um, on this topic. It does need a big, big push. Um, and I, I really like the way that Ian's described you know, what good could look like inside organisations. And um, that's every conversation and that's every opportunity. So, um, But we could probably have a lot more discussion about it over drinks as to um, where, the, where that hits. But it's, it's, it's really important. It is. And just to end on, a, on an optimistic note, um, the gender compass research, which came out re recently from Plan International, um, the vast bulk of people surveyed were in the middle they're persuadables. Yeah. And uh, I think it's really important that we remember that. Um, there's the 30% or so uh, who will never be convinced. A little, bit, a little bit, Rebecca Huntley did it. She did the climate um, survey in the same way, Climate Compass. Um, it's the same thing. The bulk are in the middle. Um, and so that, that'll be some women, um, mostly men, but it will be some women as well. But they can be persuaded. And I think that that's what we all have to remember, whether we're in corporate foundations, philanthropy, um, in, in other roles. I think you know, this, can, this can shift. 
but yes, it's taking um, just a tad longer than some of us hoped. Um, but look, thank you uh, so much. And could you please thank um, Ian and Sam? There's so many things I want to say, but we have drinks to get to and mingling to do. The one thing I will say, Annika, before I invite you up, is that we have Deanne Weir in the audience, who is not only a brilliant feminist philanthropist and a great entrepreneur, but also um, is on the board or chairs something called SEER Data. Um, and in terms of looking at data and understanding social issues, I really point you to... So it's S-E-E-R. If you don't know about it, it's a great resource. Forgive me, Anaku. If I could welcome you and um, to, to make some insights. Wrap and, yeah, wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> wrap it up with a call to action, I think, is my job. Um, thank you so much, um, Julie. Thank you, Virginia, Catherine, Sam, Ian. Um, it's just an absolute delight to support the work that Australians Investing in Women leads. And the Champions of Change Coalition stands side by side AIIW in our shared goal, which is to ensure that the impact of corporate giving programs accelerates progress on gender equality. And as we discussed, our aim is to ensure that well-meaning gender-neutral programs are not underserving women and girls unintentionally. And through the Champions of Change Coalition, as Ian shared, we continually challenge ourselves to review practices and seek new systemic approaches to accelerating change. And so to that end, our shared resource, which is here for you, it's called Sharpening Oh, there we go. Sharpening our focus on corporate giving sets out a framework for action that I invite you all to use. Uh, we started our work together. When we started, our members were really interested in testing the extent to which corporate giving was accelerating or even impeding, potentially, gender equality. And it was very easy to identify programs that specifically supported women and girls. But when it came to causes like bushfires or homelessness or climate change, youth, as we've spoken about, Catherine, what we found is that organizations were really less sure um, how the unique needs of women and girls were being considered or whether they were even benefiting equally um, by the giving. And as leaders, the onus is on us to ask the questions and to support um, our partners to deliver those answers. And that's what this resource helps everyone do. Um, I will say our members began in earnest in 2021, and as we will shortly report in our impact report, which will be out next week, almost half of Champions of Change organizations are now applying a gender lens across their giving, and that's up from just over a third a year ago. So you'd want to see 100%, and you would expect the Champions of Change to outperform the overall numbers, but the trajectory is moving, and we're keeping our eye on it. So our commitment, which we invite all leaders to make, is simple but important. Our commitment is to use our personal influence and the business levers at our disposal to ensure the impact of our organization's giving efforts advance gender equality. This requires, as Gareth pointed to earlier, and the framework is outlined in Sharpening Our Focus, leadership vision and advocacy, organization giving strategies that align with and reinforce the commitment to gender equality, organizations, systems, and processes that reflect the intention to support women and girls in every cause, measuring and reporting, we've spoken a lot about that today, and of course, strong relationships and partnerships with not-for-profits and program partners. So the resource we've developed together offers practical actions against all of those five, so if you want something to do, you can take it and go off and do that. And we share it widely in partnership with Australians investing in women with the ambition that gender equity in giving becomes an expectation rather than a consideration.